Let's pray. God, thank you for these words, these songs, uh, the story that has reminded us what Christmas is all about. We pray as we look at your word this morning that you would be glorified, that our hearts would be reminded. Uh, We pray this morning that sinners would embrace the Savior, and we ask it in his name. Amen. I think we have some Bibles here. Are there some men to distribute Bibles? If you don't have a Bible here this morning, we'd love for you to have one in front of you. And so just slip your hand up and let these guys know that you need a copy of God's Word. And if you don't own one, we'd love for you to keep uh, this as your uh, gift from us, a copy of God's Word. What is the message of Christmas? A 20th century poet uh, wrote a poem called The Journey of the Magi. He there recounts the journey of the wise men who came to see the Messiah, the baby Jesus. And in this poem, the writer imagines how arduous that journey must have been, how long and cold and dangerous it was for them to travel many miles and many months across strange lands in order to witness the birth of this new king. He imagines these wise men saying as they arrive on the scene these lines, Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. The message of the poet in this fanciful retelling of the story of the wise men is the message of Christmas. It is that Jesus was born to die. The cradle is about the cross. Bethlehem is about Calvary. Christmas is about a substitutionary sacrifice for sin on behalf of needy sinners. Every time we think about the birth of Jesus, we ought to recall his death. The reason that there is a hardly noticed baby in a feeding trough in a cattle stall in an obscure Middle Eastern village is that there would be a dying man on a cross on a hill 33 years later. Jesus was born to die. And the reason his birth is significant is because of what he accomplished in his death. The message of Christmas is the message of the cross. The question, why did Jesus come into the world, is answered for us in 1 Timothy 1.15. Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, came into the world to save sinners. In Matthew 16, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, he must be mistreated by the religious leaders, and he must be killed. And this was so shocking to his disciples that Peter turned to Jesus and said, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But you must know that the cross is not a tragic accident at the end of an otherwise wonderful life inspiring earthly existence. The cross is the reason that Jesus came. And that message, the message that the substitute death of Christ in your place is the only means of attaining a right relationship with your creator, that message is offensive. It's offensive. Have you ever thought about the fact that Christmas ought to be more offensive than it is? Our whole world here celebrates Christmas and seems to be not offended by it. But the birth of a Savior implies that I need saving. The work of Christ on the cross implies that my work is worthless. The unjust death of the perfect Son of God implies that there is a serious problem in the world as we know it. And it is a problem that no wisdom in the human mind can solve a problem that no power of human strength can defeat, and a problem that no beauty of human nature can overcome. And we as human beings do not like to admit that we can't do something. We're self-sufficient, industrious, smart. We can figure things out for ourselves. We can work things out for ourselves. We abhor being told that we are helpless. And yet the birth and death of Jesus tells that we are helpless hopeless, spiritually dead, enemies of God, completely unable to make ourselves acceptable to Him. And life and death are in the balance. Eternity is in the balance. 
this is not exactly a cheery holiday message. It's not the message of Christmas that our culture evokes with warm, fuzzy feelings. Have you ever received a Christmas card with that kind of Christmas message, the warm and fuzzy kind? Something like, may the warmth of the season fill you with gladness. You gotten any of those? Or maybe it could be worded, may the reality of your own depravity fill you with the realization that you desperately need a savior. That'd be a good Christmas card. Have you been in the mall lately? You've heard the songs. Some of the songs that we sing here and other songs. Millions of people who do not love Christ find themselves singing Christmas songs. Do you ever wonder if they wonder what it is they're singing? I wonder as I wander out under the sky how Jesus the Savior did come for to die for poor ornery people like you and like I. Can I get some hot chocolate with that? (laughs) Hark the herald angels sing, joy to the world. We just sang these songs and, and the message of these songs is I know that I'm totally helpless. I need a Savior. I've taken the liberty of retitling some of these Christmas hymns, which convey the heart of the Christmas message. Hark, I need to be redeemed. Or, woe to the world, we're all depraved. (laughs) I blunder as I squander. We could do that with a lot of these songs. And if you know the Savior, if the death of Christ is your glory because of what his death accomplished on your behalf, then the message of Christmas truly is joy upon joy. It is comfort that transcends all possible circumstance. The truth of the Christmas message for those who believe is is an eternity of blessing and joy and happiness and comfort. But if you don't know the Savior then I cannot help but think that Christmas ought to be offensive to you. Because it says that your abilities, your so-called goodness, your hard work, they are all valueless to God. Christmas says that nothing you can ever do will earn God's favor. The message of Christmas is that God had to do what you and I could not do. He had to satisfy the demands of his own holiness. He had to find a way that your sins could be paid for, and and they can't be paid for by you. There really can only be three responses to the message of Christmas, love, hate, indifference. But I have an agenda this morning, and it is to remove indifference as one of the possibilities. The only reason that our culture today is so comfortable with Christmas is that we by and large, have failed to remember its message. Christmas ought not be comfortable. The message of Christmas, which is the message of the cross, is either the greatest event in the history of the universe or else it is a symbol of great offense. And there's no middle ground. If the message is rightly understood, that we need to take comfortable off the table when we're talking about Christmas. There are only two responses to the message of Christmas, and I want you to see these in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. We looked at this passage back in August. We were looking at the foolishness of the cross, and, and I hope we've sewn these two ideas sufficiently together this morning, that Christmas is about the cross. And we rightly this morning can talk about the foolishness of Christmas as we're thinking about what it is that we celebrate. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25, the Apostle Paul writes this, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Do you understand the polarizing nature of the message of Christmas? It puts humanity in only one of two camps, the perishing or those who are being saved. And and those two groups have two fundamentally different responses to the message of the cross, uh, the message of a baby born at Bethlehem who came to lay his life down as a substitute sacrifice for sin. And the first possible response to the message of Christmas is to reject the message as offensive and weak and foolish. It's offensive, and and Paul describes the offense of the cross here in 1 Corinthians 1. It's offensive morally, and it's offensive intellectually. Anytime someone assaults human pride, it's a moral offense. You're going to tell me I can't do something that I think I can do. You're going to to tell me something that you think I don't know, but I think I do know. And, And God telling us how things really are is an offense to how we think things are. That's natural to us. The ones who are offended here are actually the ones who are morally bankrupt and not on good standing to decide what is right and what is true. And yet when right and truth comes to such morally bankrupt people, their response is, that's foolish. And so Paul here is eager to take that word foolishness and apply it to God's message. He's He's describing what the word of the cross, the word of Christmas, looks like in the eyes of the world. It it appears foolish. It appears foolish, and it's offensively foolish. This is not foolish as in just sort of silly, but abject folly, intolerable stupidity in the eyes of the world. Verse 19, God tells us that he is opposed to human wisdom. Look what Paul says. For it is written, and God here quotes himself from the prophet Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. You see, God is judicially opposed to the self styled wisdom of man and the self proclaimed cleverness of humanity. God has made it moronic. And why is God opposed to human wisdom? Because God has hidden himself from human wisdom. He tells us that, verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. In other words, God thought it was wise that the world's wisdom would never find him. Why? Because the fundamental principle of Scripture is that from him and through him and to him are all things. For man to get to God by his own prowess, his own abilities, his own merits, his own religion, his own thinking, his own philosophy, would be to ascribe to fallen human nature things that it does not have. Man is naturally opposed to God, and that opposition will not ever get him to God, and God in his wisdom has seen fit that the use of human wisdom will never get God. We'll never find him. And so God circumvents human wisdom, judges human wisdom, and brings to earth a baby as the solution to man's fundamental problem. The message of the cross, the message of Christmas is offensive because it says there's no room in God's plan for your wisdom, your power, and your glory. And if you're here this morning and you're relying on something in you to make you right with God, be prepared to have your wisdom destroyed, your power dethroned, and your glory defaced. This is what God has set himself to, according to verse 21. God does not share his glory with human brain, human brawn, human beauty. Christmas is all about relinquishing human accomplishment 
and falling on the grace of God provided by his love through the person and work of Jesus the Christ. This is why Christmas, if rightly understood, is a tremendous comfort to the humble who will surrender themselves to God and is offensive to the self-reliant. The message of Christmas is seen not only to be offensive, but also seen to be weak, weak. Think for a moment what you would do if you were God, and, and, and you're not God. Uh, if we wanted to make... If you wanted to make yourself known to the people you created, if, if you wanted to set everything right, what would you do? If you're like me, you would probably consider coming down from heaven in a blaze of glory, set up your kingdom, tell the Roman government to take a hike, put everybody in their place, punish all sin. But what did God do? He became a man, an unknown man unrecognizable as anything other than a second-generation carpenter from a shady, shady part of town. And when the time was right for him to reveal himself, he hung out with fishermen and tax collectors and prostitutes. He gathered a following among the riffraff of society, and he was killed by a Roman government who considered him nothing more than a common criminal. It's pretty lame for a rescue, Right? But this is exactly what the Jews thought. In verse 22, Paul says, Indeed, Jews ask for signs. And this isn't the kind of, Oh God, would you please give us a sign? Uh, sort of a, a reverent uh, petition of the Lord. This is a selfish judgment of God demand for something that meets human wisdom. God, I won't believe in you unless you do what I think you should do on my terms and my time right now so I can see it. It's actually atheism. It's rebellion against God to demand a sign this way. And what the Jews looked for, what they wanted was a conqueror who would come and free God's people from the oppression of the Roman government that held them hostage. They were looking for Exodus part two, they anticipated a mighty hero, a warrior king, a, a conqueror to vanquish their enemies. They wanted to see signs of power and insurrection and revolt and a return to the glory days of David and Solomon. And, and there's something right about that desire. The, the Messiah would come as a son of David and would establish his kingdom one day. But in the meantime, he would come and deal with sin the idea that their anticipated Messiah would die like a criminal on a Roman cross was scandalous. Look at verse 23. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a scandalon, a stumbling block. The Old Testament told us that the one who was hung on a tree was cursed of God. Galatians 3 reaffirms that. Jesus was cursed of God as one hung on a tree. There's no way that Messiah could be under the curse of God. Therefore, there's no way that Jesus could be the Messiah. We dare not remove the horror of the crucifixion. We become comfortable with crosses as emblems of religious affiliation, just like we've become comfortable with the cradle in a manger as a symbol of a gift-giving holiday. These aren't comfortable things. The cross was a heinous and bloody means of torturing a man to death, reserved only for the basest of criminals and slaves. Crucifixion, in fact, was so horrible that Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified, no matter what evils they had committed. And so there's no way that a crucifixion victim could be the Messiah that was promised. As someone has compared the concept of a crucified Messiah to having fried ice a logical impossibility, a crucified Messiah. Jews aren't the only ones who reject the idea of the cross on the basis of its offense, a scandal. Many Muslims believe that Allah saved Jesus from the crucifixion in order to preserve his honor. The Quran says that Jesus wasn't even crucified. One Muslim has said, we honor Jesus more than Christians do. Do we not honor him more than you do when we refuse to believe that God would permit him to suffer death on a cross? Of course, when you remove Jesus from the cross, you remove everything he was about. You remove the message of Christianity. 
And the message of Christianity gets rejected because it's offensive morally. It offends the self-styled intellectuals intellectually. And it appears as scandalously weak. The cross is seen, therefore, as foolish. Verse 23, we preach Christ crucified to Jews, a scandal, a stumbling block, and to Gentiles, foolishness. It's moronic in their view. Greek and Roman culture was enthralled with philosophic novelty. The Romans loved strength and power, and the Greeks loved what they called wisdom through philosophy. Innovative ideas, the the more profound an idea was, the more highly it was to be prized. To the Greek mind, the message of Christmas and of the cross was utterly ridiculous. There's no way in their system of thinking that a God would ever come down to earth, take on the form of a man, suffer as a mortal, and ultimately die at the hands of his people he created simply because he loved them and because they were helpless, needy. This was madness. No God would ever condescend for the sake of mere humans, much less the one true God who made the universe. To those looking for wisdom, the the cross was moronic. To those looking for power, the cross was weak. The Jews wanted Messiah on their own terms. The Greek wanted a God they could get their minds around. Romans wanted a God of strength and power. All of them were okay with the idea of a God that conformed to their own notions, which makes man his own God. And not much has changed since Paul's day when he wrote 1 Corinthians 1. People still reject the message of Christmas. People still reject the message of the cross because it offends our sense of our own goodness. We want a Savior on our own terms. We want a God that we can get our puny brains around. But the right response to Christmas and the cross is to give up the offense And to embrace the cross as everything you need personally. To come to the cross as the message of God and his love and grace to sinners. It is the wisdom and power of God. Look at verse 24. To those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Messiah, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And what the world calls foolish is wiser than all of their wisdom. And what the world calls weak is stronger than all of their so-called strength. This is the center of Christianity. This, as one author says, the dishonorable, foolish, gruesome, and utterly glorious reality of the tortured God-man Jesus Christ. More and more, he must become the issue. Not a vague, comfortable, pleasant Jesus that everybody likes, but the one who is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. The closer you get to what makes Christianity ghastly, he says, the closer you get to what makes it glorious. No gore, no grace, no glory. The cross is all about God dealing with our sin, dealing with his own holiness, Maintaining his own reputation and yet forgiving sinners. God can't tolerate evil and yet he loves sinners like us. You and I can never pay for our crimes against God. But God at Bethlehem put a baby in a manger to grow up to die on a cross to actually take our sins upon himself, to put them away from us forever so that God would credit us with his own righteousness, his own perfections, by crediting his own son with our sins. This is the great exchange that makes the cross our glory and our only hope. And, And friends, if you're here this morning and have not yet had your sins forgiven, you haven't yet experienced new life, new birth, a clean conscience, and eternity with God. You have the opportunity this morning to embrace the Savior that was previously offensive. Embrace a message that was previously foolish and see it for the wisdom and power of God that it truly is. This requires repentance, humility, brokenness, 
coming to the end of yourself and realizing, I don't have what it takes to be pleasing to God. But God has provided as a free gift all that I need to be pleasing to him. Do you realize what happened at the cross? That bloody, violent, torturous, and unjust murder of the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Do you see this morning the wisdom and power of God in it? When God's righteousness demanded my perfection, he accepted Jesus' perfection in my place. When God's holiness demanded my eternal death in hell, he counted Jesus' death in my place. Jesus died so that you would not have to. This is the wisdom and power of God. This is the message of the cross. This is the foolish message of Christmas. And it still confounds the wise guys of this world. In order to embrace the message of the cross, you must agree that with God that your wisdom is empty, your effort is futile, and that only God can make you right with him. And when you revel in these things, you actually come to a, a glory and a wisdom and a joy and a strength you never had before. We celebrate these things together. We celebrate an uncomfortable holiday, a discomforting holiday, a holiday that dislodges human pride and exchanges it with humility and gives us God's grace and love and kindness in a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes who purposed to aim for a cross where he would die to bear sin. Let's pray. God, you are so kind to look on our poor estate, our condition, our helplessness, and our sin which offended and grieved you you did not do to us what we would have done. You looked on us with pity, kindness, mercy, and love. You looked on us at our worst and gave us your best. You crushed your son in our place that we might have forgiveness in life. We beg this morning that any who do not know you that are hearing this message would repent and believe. Humble themselves before you and embrace the glory and beauty and shock of the death of Messiah Jesus in their place. We look forward to singing these things again, of giving gifts to one another in memory of your great gift to us. We pray, O oh God, that this would be an uncomfortable Christmas for all who have not yet embraced the Savior. And let us revel in the eternal comfort and joy that you have given us as a free gift in your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.